it's really a pleasure to see so many people turn out to spend out their free time to come and hear about astronomy. It's quite heartening. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a subject which is close to my heart, and that's uh, searching for alien moons, strangely enough. Um, this is a subject which I got into uh, about five, six years ago whilst working on my PhD, and it's what I wrote my PhD thesis about. Um, I was, I guess, inspired because I'm deep down I'm a sci-fi geek, and I'd seen all these films where they had uh, alien moons and things, and I thought, hey, why not? Why can't we look for these things? And when I first started working on this, I have to say it was kind of almost like a fringe subject. People were like, really? You're going to look for alien moons? That's crazy. We haven't, we've only detected a handful of planets so far. But um, it's now becoming really a, more of a mainstream uh, subject, and it's becoming hopefully a reality in the next few years. And I just want to point out this amazing artist's impression um, with a, what it would look like to be on the surface of a habitable moon with a gas drain filling your sky. Uh, there's loads of great images like this on the, on the web if you look for Dan Durda, he's a, he's a speciality on exomoons. So I want to try and cover three questions here today, try and get to the answers of these. Uh, why should we be interested in moons in the first place? Uh, what's wrong with planets, right? We've heard so wrong with planets, why are you so interested in moons? Uh, second of all, how can we actually do this? How can we find an alien moon? Do we have the technology? Do we have the methodology to do this? And finally, when will it happen? Which is a question everyone always normally wants to skip to. They just want to know the answer to this one, but I think the other two are actually more important questions to answer. Um, so let's start at the beginning. Why should we be interested in the moon? And uh, our moon is, is the perfect place to start. Our moon, the moon, imaginatively named the moon, uh, it's uh, uh, the image on the left here is the image you're probably all familiar with, and probably not so much the image on the right. Uh, this is the far side of the moon, not the dark side of the moon, as Pink Floyd would have you believe. Uh, there is no such thing as a dark side of the moon. Both sides of the moon get equal amounts of illumination. And you notice there's kind of a, a dichotomy between the two. One side has all these maria, these dark patches all over it, and the other side uh, is quite distinct. Uh, which already tells us something unusual about the origin of the moon. It must have had some strange uh, origin. It didn't fo form uniformly like many other moons in the solar system. Um, the, of course, the moon's been uh, in orbits the Earth, which orbits the sun. And the reason why we only see one side is because a long time ago, billions of years ago, the moon used to rotate freely. It used to maybe rotate once every uh, few hours or a few days. But because it's so close to the Earth, the gravitational influence of the Earth and the Moon on each other actually raises tides, like the ocean tides that we have. And these tides dissipate away that spin energy that the Moon had. So over billions of years, the Moon actually slowed down until it eventually slowed down to the slowest speed it could possibly go, which is the same rate that it goes round. So it rotates once every 28 days, and it revolves around the Earth once every 28 days. It's completely lost all of its spin energy. And now it's basically on its way out. All that energy loss is now happening through uh, the distance between the Earth and the Moon getting bigger and bigger. It gets bigger and bigger by about a few centimeters every year, in fact. It's quite significant. We will eventually lose the Moon. The um, Moon has been incredibly inspiring to human culture. It's been worshipped, painted, been films, and, of course, uh, Pink Floyd album. So it's a, it's a hugely influential part of our culture, and I think if we ever looked for a habitable planet, it'd be pretty interesting to know whether it had a moon as well and whether that's important. Uh, we did, in fact, land on the moon. It's the only planetary body that we've ever visited with a human beings ever set foot on. This is Buzz Aldrin, a uh, photo taken by Neil Armstrong, the late Neil Armstrong, who unfortunately very recently passed away. Um, and when we got there, of course, it confirmed what we already knew from telescopes on the ground, that in a way, in a manner of speaking, the moon isn't that interesting. It's actually just a big ball of barren rock. There's no atmosphere, there's no liquid water, there's no um, plants, there's no animals, there's no cheese. You know, there's, <laughs> there's nothing really of, 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 of great in human interest in a way to many people. And that's, it didn't have to necessarily be that way. You can imagine, um, what if the moon was habitable? What if the moon was for, in a different dimension somehow, you can imagine, a different universe, that the moon had been habitable, it had plants on it? You can imagine that the last 50 years would have been totally different for human civilization. We would have been setting up cities there over the last 50 years. And this isn't such a crazy idea. Moons can be habitable. Um, so the big problem with why our moon is not habitable, and this isn't a quote, I kind of uh, cheated a little bit here, because Aldrin never said this on the moon, but the, the, moon's, the moon's gravity is unfortunately too low 
to hold on to an atmosphere for billions of years, an Earth-like atmosphere. If you kind of sucked up the Earth's atmosphere and dropped it on top of the Earth, on top of the Moon tomorrow, it would lose it within a few thousand years, or maybe less than a million years. Um, and this is because the Moon is only about 1% of the mass of the Earth, and it's a little bit smaller. So it's gravity, and you've all probably seen this with the photos and the videos of the astronauts bouncing on the Moon, because the gravity is much lower. And that low gravity means that it couldn't never have an atmosphere, even if it started off with one. Um, but it's great for golf. <laughs> <laughs> As Alan Shepard discovered, I don't know quite why NASA approved him to play golf on the moon, but that was part of Apollo 14's mandate somehow. <laughs> I wish those times were back. Um, and many planets have moons, not just our own planet. So if you do a tour of the solar system, uh, all of the planets, apart from the two innermost planets, Mercury and Venus, have moons. Um, Pluto is almost like a binary planet, in fact. It's, well, it's not officially a planet anymore. But its, it's moon, Charon, is almost the same mass as Pluto, and it's almost like a binary object, um, kind of similar to the moon, uh, to the moon and the Earth, in fact. Um, the biggest moon in the solar system is Ganymede, down here for scale with the moon and the Earth. And you can see it's pretty big, but it's still not really big enough to hold on to the Earth's atmosphere. However, some moons do have an atmosphere, notably uh, Titan. Um, in fact, it's the only moon to have an atmosphere. Uh, Titan, as you can see, is pretty big. It's actually the, the same, slightly smaller than Ganymede and actually bigger than Mercury. So it's bigger than a planet. Um, the reason why Titan has an atmosphere and our own moon cannot have an atmosphere is because this atmosphere is very, very cold. It's very far away from the sun. The gas doesn't have much kinetic energy, so it doesn't really need a lot of gravity to hold onto it because it's very cold gas. If you want to have a habitable warm gases, warm air around you, blowing through your hair, then unfortunately you have to have a bigger rock than that. And uh, just to show you an example of Jupiter's moons, just see how much is going on here. There's, uh, the current counting is over 60. We're still discovering new moons all the time. At this very inner core here, uh, you actually have the biggest moons, such as Ganymede, Callisto, uh, Europa, and uh, Io, the Galilean satellites discovered by Galileo Galilei. And they're all very close to their... Uh, host body, Jupiter, and they orbit in kind of nice circular orbits. Whereas everything else out here is kind of all overlapping, it's kind of a bit more crazy. And, and these guys are much smaller, they tend to be just a, a kilometer or a few kilometers in size. And that's why we're only just detecting them, because they're very small. Um, and this is a good analogy to the solar system. The solar system is very similar to this. We have an inner core, which is like the rocky planets and the gas giants going around it. And then as you go out, you have Pluto on a slightly more eccentric orbit. And if you go even further out, you have the Kuiper Belt, which is all these kind of asteroids flying around and all overlapping in orbit. So it's a really good analogy to the solar system. So studying moon systems is pretty interesting for that purpose. Uh, moons uh, could be quasi-habitable. In fact, the best bet in my mind for a habitable body apart from the Earth in the solar system is Europa, pictured here. This is an image taken by Voyager. And you can see the surface of Europa looks to be icy. It's very reflective. In fact, that is ice. Um, the cracks on here suggest that there's some movement in the ice, that there's something uh, lubricating the motion in order for, this, for, for things to be moving on top of one another. That means that uh, there's very likely uh, an ocean underneath the surface of this ice. We don't know how thick this is likely to be, but given that the, uh, the closer you get to the core of, the, of a planet or a moon, the warmer it gets, it makes sense that there will be at some point a liquid phase transition. And that's pretty exciting because uh, we know of places on the Earth, such as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where you have things like this, these black smokers. Uh, and this is really far down at the bottom of the ocean, hundreds of meters, kilometers beneath the surface of the ocean. And right on the floor, you have these hot vents. It's kind of like a hot spring on the bottom of the ocean. And we have nutrients, heat, thermal energy, all upwelling. And around these vents, you can see life clinging on. In fact, life is thought, it's one of the a very reasonable hypothesis that life may have started here and actually percolated its way up to the surface and then eventually gone onto land. Um, so you don't need any sunlight here. There's no sunlight, there's no sunlight energy really reaching down here. Just like what could be on Europa, we don't need a sunlight uh, energy to penetrate through that icy crust. There could just be uh, life clinging on to the bottom down there. So it'd be great to have a, one day maybe we could dig through and in inject a submarine to look around, of course, very technically challenging mission, very expensive, but 
it'd certainly be in my top five wish list of missions. I'd love to see fly. Of course, if you if you just think a little bit further out, you can you can totally forget about quasi habitable and have truly habitable things, things that are truly earth like. And here's another great artist impression of what this would be like. Um, a large moon, you know, something the same size of the Earth, going around Jupiter, all in the, the right temp temperature away from the star. It ticks all the boxes. There's, there's no reason why it can't have life, just like the Earth has life. It has sufficient mass to hold onto an atmosphere. It will have a magnetic field, which will protect it from the radiation of the host planet, from the radiation from the host star. The Earth's magnetic field is plenty. Um, so it, it kind of has all of the requirements. So it's, it's a very exciting prospect. And the problem is that we don't have any Earth-sized moons in our own solar system. So you might say, well, you know, it's pie-in-the-sky stuff. Who, who knows if they're out there? But there's actually no physical reason why such things cannot form and exist. And in fact, if you, uh, a lot of work that's being done at the moment generating solar systems from scratch in computers uh, finds that large moons form very frequently. So it's not a, it seems as it's a very common scenario. But we don't know empirically yet. And of course, sci fi know this already. Um, they've got Ewoks and Star Wars and Flash Gordon, one of my favorites. A Trip to the Moon, very old film. Of course, Avatar, huge blockbuster. Even Star Trek's tried it. And most recently, Prometheus has been all involved at uh, a habitable moon. So we're just kind of catching up with these guys. These guys already worked it all out, and they're uh, waiting for us to announce the first moon. In fact, I'd go as far as to say moons can even be better than planets as being habitable environments. And there's kind of a very subtle reason for this. Now, the, the habitable zone around a star depends on how hot the star is. So this is the sun here. Obviously, very close to the sun, it's too hot. You're in this red zone. The Earth is in this nice temperate green zone, and most of the other planets are in the blue zone, too cold. And, of course, if I'm around a hotter star, then this zone expands out. It's further away. If I'm around a red dwarf star... Uh, this zone is much closer in because red dwarfs are cooler. In fact, uh, red dwarfs are the most common type of star in the universe. 70% of all stars in the universe are like this. We are not the most common type of star. We're fairly typical, but we're certainly not the most common. So we have to look at these things seriously and, and work out what's going on here. The problem is because when you're in this green zone, you're actually very close to the star at this point because you have to get very close to this campfire in order to get the heat from it. Now, the problem with that is, is that we know for the moon it gets tidally locked to the Earth. We always see the same side of the moon going around the Earth. That's because the Earth and the moon are pretty close together. And here again, we've got a planet and a star pretty close together. So what's going to happen is that the planet will have the same side facing the sun all the time. So that's a bit like you know, the United States always being in perpetual illumination and China being in perpetual cold. Now, that might sound great to you. You're like, well, I'm here, right? Who cares? <laughs> Uh, but actually, it wouldn't be so good. It'd just be, uh, we'd be baked to death here, and they'd be frozen to death over there. And there might be a very thin zone that would be the right temperature, but it's probably um, not the sort of place where complex beings like us would likely evolve. Um, but moons get around this, because even if I have a planet like the Earth here going around the sun, and let's imagine this Earth is now tidally locked to the sun, so we always have the same side of this planet facing the sun. But the moon doesn't care about that. It goes around the Earth, so you can see equal amounts of illumination hit both sides of the moon. There's no such thing as a dark side of the moon. But there is such a thing as the dark side of a planet. So that's where Pink Floyd made their mistake. <laughs> so in principle, around these red dwarf stars, which are the most common type of star in the universe, uh, moons have a significant advantage, in fact. So it's possible, possible that there are more habitable moons than planets in the galaxy. Planet-based life might be a rarity. <laughs> Moon-based life might be the most common form of life in the universe, which is a, a kind of a strange thought to think about, but it's, it's perfectly legitimate. Uh, moons are also very helpful. They make planets, they help planets to become habitable. Um, and the classic example is, of course, the Earth. The Earth is habitable, and the axial tilt of the Earth is, is stabilised by the Moon. So what I mean by this is the... This plane here is the plane in which we ro revolve around the sun. And the uh, rotation axis of the Earth is slightly tilted. It's not exactly 90 degrees. In fact, the angle is about 20 degrees here. And this 20 degrees is what gives us the seasons. It's why we have summer and why we have winter. Uh, you can see at this point, if imagine the, the sunlight coming from the left to the right, that the North Pole doesn't get any sunlight. It's just going to be in perpetual darkness for the entire summer. But, of course, that's only a few months, so it doesn't matter. You know, life can cling on for a few months. If it was 
millennia or you know, millions of years, that'd be a problem. So if this axial tilt here was, say, 90 degrees, say that axial tilt was down here, that the northern hemisphere of our planet would never receive any sunlight. And the, the southern hemisphere would have constant sunlight. So again, like that analogy of China and uh, USA, it wouldn't be a very good place for complex life. So it seems fortunate that our angle is 20 degrees. It's not just fortunate. Um, angles drift over time. They process. But the moon locks it in. Our large moon it has sufficient gravitational influence that it locks the Earth into this position. If we didn't have a large moon, it's an, it seems very likely that the axial tilt would drift. That's exactly what happens on Mars. Mars's axial tilt does drift over millions of years, and it gives rise to severe changes in its climate. So that's probably a good thing that we've got a large moon. Another um, good reason is uh, ocean tides. Um, if, there were no, if there was no moon, the tides would be much smaller. In fact, billions of years ago, the moon was a lot closer to us, which means much bigger tides. So there's lots of ocean mixing. There was lots of nutrients being washed around, forming rock pools and swilling and upwelling. And uh, it's thought that that's a pretty good thing for chemical reactions to be taking place, a good way of uh, maybe life getting started. So lots of good reasons why moons are helpful. And finally, we want to know, just for getting life altogether, is the moon a freak? I've got this great video to show you how the moon is thought to have formed. Here's um, the primordial Earth. Uh, 4.5 billion years ago we are now, and the Earth's getting battered by asteroids. It's a very chaotic place, and it's basically just a big ball of lava and magma at this point. Um, and at some point, uh, it's thought that a Mars-sized body kind of drifted too close towards the Earth. And uh, we'll see this guy come flying in in a second. Here it is. And uh, roughly the same size as the Earth, as you can see, slightly smaller. And when it hits, it really hits. And you can see the materials mixing together here. The rock is being interchanged between the two and being melted into liquid or gas. And the debris, huge amount of debris, the Earth manages to remain a sphere, more or less. And this debris kind of coalesces. Some of it lands back on the Earth. And some of it forms a new ball out here, which we call the moon. And you can see it gathering up the last particles of debris. And then the moon d decided to, it started its slow uh, spiraling outwards over billions of years into its current position. So that seems like, like that's maybe fortuitous or a freak, that, a freak event. So what we'd like to know is are planetary collisions common or not? We only have one example of it happening in the solar system. It seems verified by Apollo samples. If you collect moon rock, the rock is exactly the same rock as what we have on the Earth, more or less. There's, no way that could have happened if it formed through a centrifugal method. So it does have serious implications for how planets form and evolve, how solar systems look like in other parts of the galaxy. Uh, is this common? Is the Earth's formation unusual, or is it, in fact, an inevitability in these very chaotic systems? So let's get on to the question, how can we actually find an alien moon? Alien planets, let alone alien moons, are really hard to find. If I was on a spaceship really close to an alien planet like this, it's easy. But as I fly out, you can see that the, the planet becomes harder and harder to see. In fact, as my spaceship gets closer and closer towards the Earth, I'm flying back home now, and I start using my telescope to look at this instead, that's all I see. I just see a pinprick of light. I can't resolve, I can't see the planet and the star separately from one another. And this is because the star is a billion times brighter than the planet. The planet doesn't actually um, produce any energy. It just reflects energy off the sun. The sun is a big nuclear furnace, so of course it's much, much brighter. Uh, second of all, the, the separation between the two objects is equivalent to a human hair held about two football pitches away. So it's, even our best telescopes uh, would really, really struggle. We're just about at that kind of... Uh, edge at the moment with our biggest uh, telescopes, but it's extremely difficult to get down to that. And then even if you do, you have to balance with this billion times brightness ratio. So direct imaging is very difficult, but it, it can be done in some kind of unusual cases. But for the Earth and the Sun, we're not quite there yet. We can't directly image planets. Uh, there is a shortcut, though, and that's called the transit method. Um, this is one of the most successful methods of detecting planets. Um, it doesn't need you to resolve the planet and the star from one another. So it's a shortcut. 
Um, it only works in cases where the solar system you're looking at happens to be aligned to your line of sight. So, of course, most of the time, most alien solar systems, this will not be true. But a small fraction, around 1% or so, uh, will be aligned to your line of sight. And those objects, you can look for planets. The way it works is, as the planet uh, skits across the surface of the star here, it actually blocks out some of the light from the star. And therefore, the brightness observed will get lower. So we don't see this in our telescope. We can't see this, but we do see this. We see the brightness get dimmer and then come back up. And that is, of course, the signature of this type of event. This doesn't prove it's a planet. It could also be, at this point, a very small star around a very big star or something like this. But um, we can then follow this up with more detailed methods to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Um, the nice thing is it gives us the size of the planet quite easily. Just the, the amplitude of that drop in brightness basically is the area of the planet divided by the area of the star. So we can work out the radius of the planet straight off the bat. Uh, it also lets us get the period of the planet, how long is a year on this planet, just by waiting for repeated dips. And we can even get the velocity of the planet, and therefore how far away it is from its sun, by the, by the width of this event that gives us the velocity. So there's lots of things we can do with transits. And they've allowed us to detect many alien planets so far. This is the discoveries so far. Uh, they all kind of began in 1995. And there was a few, there were actually a few cases that were kind of, um, people were unsure if they were a planet or not, even as far back as 1989. But it turns out they were right. But the, the, real, the real game kind of started in 1995. Um, and you can see that not all of these planets, first of all, were detected by transits, but many of them are. Some of the highlights are here are the first transiting Jupiter-like planet in the uh, year 2000. That was done by Professor Charbonnet, who's here at the... Uh, at Harvard. He's, he works here at the Center for Astrophysics. He's just a few doors down from me. Uh, in 2004, we discovered a Neptune, our first Neptune. And again, these planets are very hot. That's because they're very close to the star, and they're the easiest for us to get. So not habitable things by any means, but interesting that we can do it. And it didn't take long for us to actually start detecting rocky things. In 2009, we detected a, a rocky planet, Corot 7. The Corot spacecraft detected this. And again, it's very hot, as you can see in Arthur's impression. And then very recently, during this huge upwelling, this exponential rise of planet detections brought in by Kepler, um, this is Kepler 22b. It's the first habitable zone transiting planet we've ever found. Um, it's, it's somewhat in size between these two objects. So it's like a mini Neptune. So it probably doesn't have a surface, probably doesn't have a solid ground that you can walk on. But it, it, it could very well do have an ocean all across its surface, which maybe life is uh, residing on. So we're very close to the next step, of course, is this, but a bit smaller. That it's rocky. And we're very close to doing that. I wouldn't be surprised if you heard about something like that before the, ends out, before the year is out. I wouldn't be surprised if you heard of a discovery like that. And just to give you a sense of how hard this is, you know, the scale of these objects, you can sometimes forget it. But uh, Jupiter is a lot, lot bigger than the Earth. It's 100 times bigger. And to detect this area is actually it's a 1% dip in light, whereas to detect the Earth's area is uh, 84 parts per million. It's a very, very small change in the brightness of a star. And to go from that to that in 10 years is remarkable progress. And it's really a, 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 it kind of is a testament to the dedication of the many astronomers who have worked so hard to push this field forward. Uh, one of the epitomes of this is the NASA Kepler mission. It's a wonderful telescope uh, launched in 2009, uh, and it's designed to detect Earth-like planets with the transit method. Um, you can see here the observation of the spacecraft, and this is the, uh, a real image of the, um, the camera that the telescope uses, the CCDs. It's 18 uh, CCD uh, segments here. Actually, each one of these is actually two. You might be able to see the fine line there between the two. Um, segments, and so far it's discovered over 2,300 candidates, and this camera is basically the same camera that's in your iPhone or in your digital camera, but just way, way more precise, and it's extremely precisely engineered, and that's how we're able to get this uh, incredible precision. It looks at um, part of the sky between Lyra and Cygnus, and it stares at this same patch constantly, all the time. It's been looking there for three years so far, 
hopefully it will look for another three years if NASA keeps supporting the mission. We can keep getting funding for it. And we need lots and lots of data like that so that we can um, confirm these transit signals. If you're looking for an Earth going around the sun, you only see a dip once per year. And it lasts only for a few hours. So you have to make sure you're looking at the right time. Uh, so we really, you want to have at least three events, at least three years of data as an absolute minimum. But in reality, um, the noise of the star and the, the fact we're right at the edge of the detection limit means that we need a little bit more data than that. So um, we think sort of six or seven years of Kepler flying should be enough to um, detect many, many Earth-like planets if they're out there. Uh, these are all the planets on the CCD, uh, a great kind of representation of where you can see them. The red dots are Jupiter-like planets. The oranges are Neptunes. The greens are super-Earths, so planets a bit bigger than the Earth, but probably rocky. And the blues are Earths. So you'll notice there's a lot of orange, a lot of green, not a, not a huge amount of red and not a huge amount of blue. And that's because the blues are hardest to find, so we think there's a lot more blues in there, we just need more data. And we think that the reds are actually very rare because they're actually really easy to find. So we should have... If reds were very common, the big Jupiter-like planets were common, we should have found loads of them by now. And we don't actually find loads and loads of them. They're not that common. So that's kind of interesting in itself. Rocky planets seem to be more common than Jupiter-like planets. These are all the planets scaled up. Great image by Jason Rowe. Uh, just to give you a sense as to how many have been detected. Each of these is to scale. And you can see the little black dot, little black disk on each of them. That's the scale of the signal that we've detected. This one here is the sun with Jupiter, for comparison. You can see many of the stars are much bigger, many of them are much smaller. The color gives the temperature of the star. And uh, you can't even see the Earth on the sun up there. It's, my laser point is kind of dying on me a little bit, but um, you can't even see the Earth. You can see Jupiter, but the Earth is on there, and it's less than a pixel. You can't even make it out. This is a great video about Alex Parker I want to show you called Worlds. He made this very recently. And he said, imagine if all those planets went around the same star. What would it look like? I think this is amazing. It's, it's an incessant transiting planets. You can't, star doesn't get a breather. And you can see time elapsing on the bottom here. The different colors represent the, sort of the temperature of the planet. The periods are all correct to scale. The ratio of radio are all correct to scale. You can get this on YouTube. and it's, I'm only going to show you the first minute, but you can watch the full three and a half minutes online, lots of different angles and things. And it just gives you a, a sense as to how incredibly successful Kepler has been. Before Kepler flew, we knew of about 100 transiting planets. There's now 2,300, most of which are almost certainly real planets. Um, and it, I just love this figure. So I recommend you have a look online. You can see, just zoom out. That's the orbit of Mercury, that line there. So you can see many of them are really close to their star. Um, and that's because they're the easiest to detect. We think there's actually plenty out here as well. We just haven't filled that up yet. So with this incredible technique, can we use it to find moons? Getting back to the point. Um, moons cause strange transits. Um, if we had a planet here, transiting across its star, and there's the moon, separate, distinct. What we should see is one transit signal from the planet and then one transit signal due to the satellite. And basically, what you'd see is just the summation of those two events. You'd see this kind of funky red line here. So you can imagine looking at some real data, seeing this blip. It should stand out as being a, a moon. This is called an auxiliary transit. Auxiliary because it's separate. Um, another type of event you can have is where all three disks overlap with each other. So the big disk is the star, uh, the medium-sized disk is the planet, and the smallest disk is the moon. Now, if all three overlap, you can't just add them all together like that, those signals. What happens is, imagine at this point here, uh, the planet and the moon both come into transit because they're very close together but not overlapping. And then the moon suddenly starts to hide behind the shadow of the planet. So when the moon hides behind the planet, the flux from the star actually seems to go up again. And then when the moon comes back out of hiding, then it goes back to both of them. So you get these bumps in the light curve like this. And these bumps, which we call mutual transits, um, would be a way of detecting moons. You could also have a mutual transit of two planets. Uh, it's less likely. You could have, just by coincidence, two planets happen to transit across the star at the same moment in time. I'm sure in Alex's simulation it would have happened all the time. 
But uh, in a real solar system, it's kind of rare geometrically that that would happen. But because the moon is so close to the planet on, a, on the scale of things, that it's actually quite a common event that this should happen. And finally, the moon has gravity, and it affects the orbit of the planet. Um, the, it's a common fallacy to think the moon orbits the Earth. In fact, the moon and the Earth orbit a common center of gravity, uh, as Newton told us. Uh, you can imagine here a pivot point, and what's happening is that the two orbit around this common center of gravity. So what this means is that the planet is not going around the star in a nice kind of circular orbit. It has some, uh, some wobbles to it. It's a depiction of it here. Um, this is from Sky and Telescope magazine, in fact. Um, and you can see the planet kind of gyrating around. So I'm not even showing the moon. I'm just showing the wobble of the planet. And what happens is that it gives rise to timing effects, which means instead of getting a, a planetary transit once every year, for the Earth, it should transit once every 365 days. Sometimes that event happens five minutes early. Sometimes it happens five minutes late. And that's because the planet has this very small wobble on top of its yearly motion. So if we detect these timing effects, that a, a transit happens five minutes late or early, that's a really strong signal that there's uh, something pulling on it. And that pull could be a moon. It could also be another planet as well. But this is one of the effects we can look for. So Alex Parks, again, he's done another great, he's really top on this stuff. Uh, he's done a fantastic representation of what these transits would look like in real time. And you can see the, the moon orbiting around the planet, and it's in a highly inclined orbit here. So you can see that it's going up and down, up and down. It's not in the same plane as the planet. And, uh, of course, when the planet transits across the star, you get a blip. There, the moon didn't actually transit. It was outside the disk of the star. So there's an important point. Not every transit will show the moon. Only some of them will. Here it comes again, and there we see the blip due to the, the moon on the edge. Uh, a nice auxiliary transit in that case. And, of course, when it goes behind the back of the star, you don't see anything. Uh, but when it comes in front, we can see the signal. So it's these kind of signals that we're looking for, and it's, it's great to imagine what's actually happening. So when will we actually um, detect the first alien moon? Um, can Kepler do it? It seems like, uh, what I've told you, it's uh, the right instrument for the job. It's certainly the best instrument for the job we have. Um, so this is what I spent my PhD thesis working on and my postdoc days working on. And of course what every good astronomer does before they uh, ask to use up loads of telescope time is to simulate it on a computer and see whether it's actually feasible or not, what you're trying to do. And this is such a simulation that I generated. Um, you can see here the planetary transit due to a Neptune-like planet in the habitable zone. So it, it's too big to be habitable itself, but it's in the right distance. And it's going around a red dwarf in this case. And the moon is very far away. You can see the separation between the planet and the moon is sufficient that you get really clean, separate events. I'll just highlight them here for you. And these uh, auxiliary transits, you know, you, they just really stand out by eye. Now, a key point here is that M these red dwarf stars, even though they're very common in the universe, Kepler is not designed to look at them. So it doesn't actually, ha it doesn't actually look at many of them, even though they're very common. Um, and that's because the, the light that comes... Well, Kepler's main mission is to find a planet around a sun-like star. That's its mission design. Um, so by choosing a small star like this, I've actually exaggerated all of these effects. Because obviously the smaller the star, the bigger these dips will appear. So you should bear that in mind, that most stars that Kepler has won't look as good as this. But if I add noise onto the data, you can still see these signals. They're a bit hairy now, but you can still make them out. And in fact, if you use a computer to fit it, you get a signal-to-noise of 50. Uh, and that's, to give you a perspective, the Higgs boson, which was announced recently, was a signal-to-noise of 5. So this is 10 times more significant than the Higgs boson, if it, if it was real data, of course. Um, but what that, what that means is that I can make this star actually much bigger than this. I can make it a sun-like star, and we'd still be able to detect these events with kind of signal to noise of five, like the Higgs boson. Um, of course, you wouldn't see it by eye, because these events would now be so small that the human eye would be no good, and computers would have to take over. So that's why I showed this. And just to show you what happens if it's, a, if it's a mutual event, you get these nice blips in the middle here. Um, due to the planet and the moon all eclipsing one another at the same point in time. You can see there are two events. That's because the, the moon has gone from the front to the back of the planet 
during one transit. So the transit lasts for here for about 15 hours, I think it is, and the, planet has, the moon has an orbital period of just a few hours, I think it's eight hours, and it can get all the way from the front to the back in half that time. So it's, it's, uh, this is kind of an extreme case, but it's possible that you could see two events like this, just from one moon. And here it says signal to measure 25 with Kepler. So again, it sounds reasonable, right? It should be there. So can Kepler do it? Yes, it can. But uh, really, for the best cases, um, when I studied this, and you know, Kepler has a lot of stars in its field of view, 150,000 stars which it looks at. And I've worked out that about 25,000 of those are bright enough for us to detect an Earth-like moon around them. So that's, it's not that depressing, actually. That's actually a pretty decent subsample of Kepler's field of view. It means the faintest stars in Kepler's field of view, we can't do anything with them. But all the close-by ones, all the bright ones, we can do a lot with. Um, but the thing why you've not heard of a moon yet, and I can't, unfortunately, announce a moon today, is because um, star spots are a real pain in the neck for us, and they're really slowing us down. Uh, sunspots, uh, as you can see here, an image of sunspots, um, you can't see them with the naked eye unless you've exceptional eyes. Um, I wouldn't advise looking at the sun for sunspots anyway. Uh, you, you can see these dark blemishes, which are due to magnetic field lines on the sun, kind of all uh, converging together and uh, stopping the normal convection cycle. So you get a, a slightly cooler part of the sun. Um, they can be pretty big. In fact, this, this is a real size comparison. You can see it's pretty close to the size of the Earth. This is a real pain in the neck, because if you're looking for Earth-sized moons, and you've got Earth-sized star spots, very common. That seems like an annoying cosmic coincidence that's trying to trick us. And they cause almost exactly the same type of events as well. As the planet transits across a dark patch of star spots here, because it's darker, then the amount of flux actually goes up. So you know the, the, st the planet is blocking out light. And if this doesn't have any light to block out, then of course it's going to bump back up. So this looks very similar to the sort of bumps that we're looking for for moons. And this is what's uh, slowing us down. But we are making a lot of progress on this problem. There's very different properties between the two, of course. Here's an example. We know this planet, uh, this is real data. We know this planet doesn't have a moon because it's far too close to its star. It's what's known as a hot Neptune. So it's a Neptune very, very close to its host star. It couldn't possibly have a moon. Um, and what we see in the data... Uh, lots and lots of blips all over the place. This is a great paper by uh, Roberto Ajeda Sanchez at MIT. And uh, he shows you that you know, all these blips, um, they, well, they look a lot like moon signals. And in this case, we know it can't be a moon. But if this planet was further out from its star, then we might look at it more seriously and say, hey, I've detected 27 moons here or something. But this isn't 27 moons, unfortunately. It's lots of star spots. And it, is, it can be very difficult to tell the difference. So that's what's, just to give you an insight as to what's slowing us down on a day-to-day -day grind, this is what we deal with. Um, so I'm uh, leading a project to try to um, make a moon detection a reality. Uh, you can look at our website, exomoon.eu. Hopefully that's easy enough to remember. exomoon.eu. And uh, it's a project being run here from Harvard. And we have computers in the basement right now which are grinding through Kepler data as we speak. Uh, running very, very hot temperatures because these computers, are, I work them very hard. And uh, they're, they're, every day they look at a new system trying to look for moons. So uh, we're making a lot of progress and hopefully we'll have some exciting results soon. Uh, well, our first detection of uh, not a moon but of something else was this planet, just to give you an idea of another false positive. And this is what we saw in the data, it's just a real plot. Actually, this was done by uh, amateur astronomers. Amateur astronomer emailed me and said, hey, look at this. And uh, I said, hey, yeah, that looks really like a moon. And he'd read all my papers, and he'd, he was really well read about the subject. And uh, he said, that looks like a moon. I agreed with him. And I said, let's do a, a paper together on it. So we started working on it. And um, when we plotted all of the transits and, a, uh, and assumed that they go around the star like clockwork, you know, like it goes around once every 365 days or whatever its year is, uh, we saw that that wasn't a very good model, that this planet wobbles. This does have wobbles in space, and that was really exciting. So not only does it have anomalies in the transit, it wobbles about in space, and you can see it kind of drifting this smooth pattern here. So could this be a moon? We were, I was so excited when I first saw this. 
so we tried fitting these wobbles. These are the wobbles, these, da these black data points, uh, up wobble or a down wobble, basically. And you, we tried to fit it with a moon model. This is the green line. And you can see it doesn't really do that great a job. It, doesn't, it seems to miss a few data points out here. And I wasn't really satisfied with this. I was thinking there's something else going on here. Um, so we, we tried a second planet instead. And that's what happened. So when we imagined that it was a planet that was further away, that we couldn't see, it didn't transit the star, but it, its its gravity was still present. It was influencing the orbit of the other planet. And that was almost a perfect fit. It's very rare I've seen fits as good as this using dynamical stuff. Um, so that was kind of the icing on the cake. And uh, more detailed analysis showed that those initial anomalies were indeed star spots. So our old friend star spots came back to say hello. Uh, but KY 872 was um, a great system for us anyway because we were able to confirm it as being a real planetary system and detect another planet that no one knew about just through these wobbles. So uh, we had a science paper a couple of months ago on this. So not a moon this time, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, the Hunterfax moons with Kepler continues. And uh, stay tuned, and hopefully we will have some more exciting stuff than that in the future. So I'll leave it with that. Thanks. Thank you.